Okay, and so we uh, go straight forward. As you might know the agenda, we would have expected Anna Trautmann here now. Unfortunately, she can't be here with us today, but her husband um, will cover for her, uh, Arne Trautmann. He is Chief Legal Officer, and now we can see you. Hello, Arne. I hope you can hear us. I can hear you Perfect. perfectly well. Perfectly Thank you so fine. much, and sorry for the sudden change. Don't worry. <laughs> That's totally fine. We're happy to have you here. Um, I hope Anna gets uh, well soon. And yeah, we will now hear something about access management and the GDPR from you, um, driving efficiency and security with compliance. So please share your screen with us and yeah, you can start. I'm trying to do that. One second. I hope I get this done. So does it work? It does, looks perfect. Fantastic. So then I shall take over if I may. So first of all, again, sorry for everybody expecting Anna here. Um, we have a case of post Oktoberfest Corona. So we are still in this world um, where um, these autumn festivities act as a super spreader event. It is what it is. Uh, I take over. Um, I have to say, please cut me some slack. Um, I got the news um, this morning. Yesterday, we thought it might work. Today, it isn't fever is 39 and so on. So um, I hope I can manage this. Um, yeah. And that, that being said, uh, who I am and who I'm not am, uh, here we are. Uh, first of all, welcome to the show. Second of all, thank you, Bitcom, for having us here um, at the Privacy Conference. And my talk is about access management and the GDPR. And I put this subline in here, driving efficiency and security with compliance. Now, um, obviously, that is a bold claim. Uh, many of us here, I mean, you're, you're mostly professionals, I understand, in the space. And so you know, you're very well aware that um, compliance does have a bit of a bad reputation sometimes. Um, many compliance trainings, they are fantastic ones, but some are a bit drab and boring, out of touch with the reality sometimes. Uh, at least that's how they are being perceived by people. I'm not saying this is right, but this is the perception. So this may be a bold claim, but hear me out. Um, what I have to say, I think if you talk about um, compliance, we can drive all these other things. Now, why do I think, oh, how do I... Now, why do I think I can tell you something about this? Um, well, I'm not Anna. <clears throat> I'm Anna Trautmann. This would have been Anna. So Anna, and again, it's her talk. It's her slide here. Um, she was. Well, uh, she is uh, the uh, head of projects at at NGT, Not uh, like me. She's more operational uh, than me. She was born in, uh, in not here in Germany, but in Tajikistan, and uh, fled the post-Soviet turmoil and civil war. Came to Germany. Uh, spent several years developing electronic messaging services for the healthcare sector, so she has much more of a technical background than I have. And today is a proud mother uh, and head of project at Engity. And at Engity, I'm also there. Uh, we do um, identity and access management uh, as a service. So that's uh, that is our raison d'être, and this is why I think we can say a bit uh, about the thing. And Anna also studies law now at the Ludwig Maximilian University here in Munich. So she would have been your host. So uh, with all that uh, out of the way, what's this? What's the current state of access management? Um, why is it so central in compliance? And why is it yet so often, of course, terrible in compliance? Here's my take on that. So first of all, what are we talking about? Um, what is access management uh, in, 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 in this uh, here? It's a framework or a system that, that helps organizations, not just businesses, but also um, administrative organizations, everything, um, sec to securely manage and control user identities, the authentication, authorization, and permission to access systems, applications, and data. A user here can also be a system itself, can be a machine. Yeah, that's that's uh, interesting to understand. So basically making sure that the right individuals or system have the appropriate, very important, and here the compliance already comes in, access privileges while maintaining security and compliance. So we already see the tension in the field here. And of course, if you talk about this space, you come across the typical two and three letter abbreviations, IAM and AM and IM and UM and all these things. They all basically, they're not completely the same, but for our uh, purposes, they mean the same access management. I personally, I prefer the IM abbreviation, identity access management, because I am, I mean, the pun is built in the word 
Now, if all these things are not designed or implemented poorly, things can break very easily. And I have brought a few examples here. One thing that is very recent that happened uh, earlier this year uh, in May, uh, the cyber attack on Evotech, which was probably, details are as always not completely clear, but it was a ransomware attack and probably facilitated by the use of some improper access management. And that led uh, to a delisting of Evotech from um, the Deutsche Börse, from the MDAX, I think it was, um, uh, or TechDAX, I'm not completely sure. Um, and uh, why was that? Because they couldn't access their data and they couldn't finish their quarterly, uh, the yearly report for the year uh, 2022. And that in turn, according to the statutes of the Deutsche Börse, leads to the listing. There was also um, uh, a, a problem with manufacturing, uh, with all kinds of things. So that's pretty bad. So that's that's one of the things. But it can get even worse. If you think about that's also a new example, uh, profit. Profit used to be, and I have to use the past tense here, used to be a manufacturer of e-bikes, so a booming segment uh, in the market, but they had to go bust. They went uh, insolvent. Why was that? Again, they were being hacked and the production um, was being disrupted. So they couldn't, for weeks, they couldn't do anything. Uh, warehouses went empty and they had to go out of business. And the reason here, and, and you already see the compliance angle here, uh, was a combination of a technical and organizational uh, mishap uh, because hackers got hold of a password of some IT administrator uh, who used the same password, the same access credentials over multiple applications. And some of them were private ones. So we had a mix of private and uh, and business use. And of course, they are much less well protected uh, than the systems of Evotech. I'm pretty sure they were well protected. Um, but those private, I don't know, a, a forum or something or some social media login. So that's pretty bad. And it gets even worse. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, an older example um, but but I think it's a very good one because it is an excess excess, uh, so uh, having access to more data than one should have, and it's a Cambridge Analytical scandal that hit uh, the company formerly known as Facebook, now known as Meta. And here you already have the issue. That thing was so bad. Like the older among us may remember um, that Cambridge Analytica got access to user data they shouldn't have had access, uh, and then targeted those users with very specialized messages uh, because of course you know a lot about users on social media and they claim to have flipped the american election in favor of trump it's pretty pretty terrible to say that uh, and and uh, basically uh, an attack on democracy itself so um that that's um that was a pretty bad bad uh, bad thing and if you think about it they had they had to rename the company nobody trusts them any longer and if you think about that was also kind of the beginning of the tech slash, so of an increased regulatory oversight on social media and the tech space as a whole, which depending on which side you stand, may be a good or a bad thing, but it is a thing that happened. So with these examples in mind, why do we have to look at access management when you think about compliance? Why is that important? Now, as we know, every corporate task has only limited resources. That includes compliance, privacy, and data protection, obviously. You cannot, you can spend only so and so much. Um, and that means that you have to choose wisely where and how you spend. And this is where data protection maybe often gets this bad reputation or this, this, you know, this kind of ring. It's weird. If you think about things like, um, you know, the birthday list that is hanging, printed out on a piece of paper in the copy room of the company, and that merits its own entry in the list of processing activities of the company and is being taken seriously as a data processing, a processing activity, people might think that we compliance people set our priorities wrong, that, that we don't, don't have them straight. And they may have a point in a way, at least that needs to be explained. On the other hand, if you think about IAM or the sex management, that's a natural place to start. Yeah. If you think about the Pareto equivalence, you know, balance. If that is a point where you can get maximum impact with very reasonable effort and kill many birds with one stone, it's not just compliance. It's more than that. And I will come to that. So, and why is that? Well, first of all, access management is an obvious attack vector for both. The bad actors, um, the, the black hat uh, hackers, as we have seen in these examples, but also for intelligence activity. 
So if you think about, um, for example, you as uh, in the intelligence community there and law enforcement, of course, they read our data. Um, and, uh, and, and if you have these access credentials and you look at them, then what you see is they are already personal data as such, obviously, because you have a username, um, you have a password, um, you have an email, for example, all of these are already personal data. But the thing here is, and that what makes it so valuable for all these actors, um, that they open the access to everything behind the login. So all these data that you, that you can access with the uh, credentials, they are open once you have the credentials. And even worse, you may actually be able to compromise the whole system in the privilege escalation once you're in. So that's that's pretty interesting. And this means they are valuable and way too often low-hanging fruit for uh, the for bad actors uh, as the multitude of successful attacks show and I mean, these were just three examples um but then again if you if you subscribe to any of these newsletters and you in the space of course you do every single day you have one of these attacks of these successful attacks and that's these are only the ones that surface and the space is expanding so what does it have to do with compliance with the GDPR? Well, the GDPR places strict requirements on organizations regarding the handling of personal data. Obviously, that's the raison d'etre of the GDPR. And just, just a few here, we have access control. Well, it's called access management. Uh, that's a no-brainer that that's touched by this, but also accountability. I mean, you see who you can log who logged in. So, um, so that's very interesting for that kind of space. There's incident response and there's also that date. Oh, what's wrong here? Uh, that's, that's, that's doing, that's not me. That's my, my keyboard, I guess. Um, so, um, all these, um, uh, all these tasks that we are being given by the GDPR can be tackled by proper access management. So it is crucial. So let's look at the ought. That's what the, was the, was the is, but how should GDPR compliant and mission adequate? Again, we have to square the circle, I think, coming from a business side. How does it look like? Well, first of all, it's, there's nothing new. I know it, but this is a moving target and we have to be aware of that. Uh, the state of the art in access management is in constant flux. Many things that we do today and think are industry standards were not industry standard five, 10 or 20 years ago. So if you think of multi-factor organization uh, authentication, yes, of course. I mean, I've been there and I've seen the first tokens that get the one, uh, one-time password that is only valid for 30 seconds as a second factor, a thing, not a thing you know, but a thing you have. You have to have the token in your hand. I've seen these in the late 90s, but that was in a very corporate environment and the Fortune 500 or DEX 30 at the time, um, companies, they had these things or maybe some uh, some businesses in the critical infrastructure, but it was not the widespread thing. It wasn't state of the art. We have things like single sign-on and of course what we do, identity as a service. Um, that's pretty new. That's a cloud-based approach. Uh, identity federation, these kind of things, all pretty new. It's constantly changing, but it's not just what access management can do. Also the threat landscape is evolving rapidly. If you think of things like dictionary attacks or DDoS as a service, Yes, they've been around, obviously, but now we have much more firepower available also for bad actors, for unfaithful actors in, in the space uh, that open opens uh, the door for all these brute force attacks. We have so many password spraying attacks. Think back to the Evotech case that was basically password spraying. Um, that are very much successful and much more successful these days than they were before because we have so many more um, logins uh, to administer. They are proliferating. And of course, the legal requirements are changing, or maybe they are not, but at least perceived they are. Consent management, of course, was always a topic even before the GDPR. But did we really look into it, if we are honest? Um, it, it has gained in my, I also work as a lawyer, at least in my experience, people really only became aware of it after 2018. That's at least my experience. And I, I stand to be corrected at this point, of course. Um, and last not least, users demand and expect a better, better user experience. And that can also be furthered by a good uh, access management. If you think about users who have to sign on themselves uh, and administer their credentials themselves, uh, not in an organization um, where you have uh, uh, where you have an organizational intern access management, but uh, a customer in uh, identity and access management. The users have to sign up themselves, basically. So the first thing they have to start, obviously, is that a proper access management has to use 
has to force the use of safe passwords because passwords let's be honest i mean we have we have heard so many swan songs uh, on the current demise of passwords but they're not going away anywhere soon um the typical login is still uh, a username and or uh, email and the password we will have that so the current system should at least check the password strength most can do that but also have to align that with the password policy of the organization yeah because we're not only talking about technical but only also about organizational measures in the gdpr office so they have to be aligned uh, a thing that should be done i think that state of the art in the meantime i can say is uh, the checking for breach passwords to prevent spraying attacks and dictionary attacks so as you all know um, breach passwords can be bought in bulk in the darknet and are being used for spraying attacks so uh, a proper access management, especially a cloud-based one, should take that into account and check against these databases and prevent the use of passwords that will be subject to such black hat use. Uh, and of course, all these technical aspects are only the one side because the technical and the organizational side in the GDPR. So these organizational measures such as to prevent the reuse uh, of credentials on multiple service monitoring and auditing of these things uh, they should be taken into account as well as of course should be key logging uh, because well you can have the best password in the world if it, the world if it's being locked uh, then it's of no use and measures to prevent phishing and that can only be done of course by educating the users obviously so this is not so much a technical but more an organizational measure so which means that if we have this technical side of access management it needs to be wrapped into this organizational science that many of you, of course, um, are very much aware of. Um, then, of course, I think the, the the there's this wisdom in choosing the right tool for the right job. Very important. We have so many advanced lock-on technologies these days that go way beyond the simple password, social logins, enterprise logins, single sign-on, and multi-factor authentication, biometrics, which used to be so terrible, uh, but now we have it on our phones, basically, yeah? but, but the fingerprint, very interesting, I think, a good development, magic links. And all of the, these have, of course, their pros and cons, depending on the use case. And we can go into that into detail, just as I mean, there are volumes being written about this, just about uh, the same is true for the passwords. I mean, you can, uh, you can write books about that. Um, so I think the wisdom here is right tool, right job, look at what is required and then choose the appropriate tool and you should be safe. And again, following the state of the art and the state of the art is not one thing. It depends on what you do. Um, well, of course, our pet project, and you have to forgive us, um, but we are in this space, is a well-kept and maintained uh, access management system. And why is that so important? And why is it often so terrible? But what we see in the market is, um, well, establishing an access management system is a complex undertaking in this quickly evolving landscape. I tried to sketch this out. And most businesses, at least, are not specialized in doing that. I and mean, what do businesses do? They do business. So they are experts in whatever they do. And of course, they spend their resources, limited resources, we have that, uh, on their core business because they need to make money and need to make their shareholders happy. That's what they do. So that means they can only throw so and so much expertise that they may not even have and of course resources that they may lack or need elsewhere on the access management so it's very often a bit overlooked um, and taken as a stepchild in a way which is terrible again coming back to this idea that this is a very low-hanging fruit for bad faith actors so we believe and if this sounds like advertisement Forgive me. Uh, we believe uh, that when a doubt, uh, businesses and organizations should use a provider to do that because there is expertise, there is specialization, there's people who do that as their core business, and it reduces the internal IT burden because then again, an, an access management system doesn't only have to be established, it has to be maintained over the lifetime of, uh, of that system. Uh, and very often these systems uh, provide for uh, scalability and flexibility, which sounds simple but it is not if you ever thought about uh, a company that is growing rapidly uh, and has started with a system that is limited and can grow only so and so far that may put a, a strain on the development of the company so it's a pretty big problem and of course compliance and security things we discussed typically these are things that are key, can being handled by one actor who knows what they do much better than uh, by a handmade system that may or may not do what it should do
Um, and there's one thing, of course, and it, this is a difficult discussion, I have to say, and we have this discussion very often with our customers, um, and I just throw it at you, and and, and please um, feel very free to comment on that. Uh, if, you, if you have a, a good opinion on that, I, I'm pretty sure many of you have. Uh, we believe strongly, I should say, um, that the processing of uh, the identity provision, especially if it's done as a service in the cloud, should happen in the European Union. And it does entail not just the server or the cloud that happens, but also the headquarters of the company. And we know that many of the access management uh, players are American companies. Why is that so interesting? Well, then again, identity as a service, cloud-based access management, that is something where the provider acts as a data processor according to Article 28 of the GDPR. So that means that we have a data transfer um, and uh, many countries are not in the European Union for one reason or the other, maybe because they're not in Europe. And so we need a transfer tool, and especially in the terms in, 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 in the US, where again, most of the uh, providers are situated right now, that is still a problem. Now, of course, we do have the standard contractual clauses. Uh, and of course, we have the transatlantic data privacy framework. Um, but is that really a good idea to rely on, on such a transfer tool? I would say no. Why is that? Big discussion, ongoing discussion. Well, the TADPF is the third installment of such a transfer tool to the US. We had two before. We had the safe harbor, we had the privacy shield. And if we look into the details of the TADPF, it looks very much the same like these old transfer tools and both were stuck down with big fanfare, I should say. Not just like hmm, maybe, but like completely by the European Court of Justice. Um, so is it really a good idea to rely today on a transfer tool and build infrastructure, build on that trust that should last for like five, 10, maybe even 15 years, because that is the life cycle of such a such infrastructure when we have a legal quicksand situation. So two, the, two years from now, the TLDPF could be that. And even if it's not that, I mean, even if you rely on that, uh, the question is, um, look on the US side, the Cloud Act, the, uh, the Patriot Act, they don't go away. And it's very hard for us to even know what's happening there, TLDPF, whatever. I mean, uh, I have no illusions that US intelligence communities will look into these data if they only can. And then again, coming back to my opening statement, that's not just true for the server, but also for the headquarters of the company, as we have learned in the now infamous Microsoft case, in, um, where Microsoft argued the data that they had on their Irish servers in Ireland should not be accessed under the Patriot Act, yet they lost the case. So it's about American data from the American view are data of American companies, even if they are stored on uh, affiliated company servers in Europe. Uh, so I think that's 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 pretty this, this, uh, that's pretty interesting to know. So important to know, I made this point three times, but it, it, give me a fourth time. Uh, all these things are just one leg of the whole thing. So the GDPR compliance is not only about technical compliance, it's also about organizational measures. They must work together, they must complement each other. That means the uh, access management system must inform, but must also be informed. It's a back and forth by the organizational part of the TOMS. Very important and very often overlooked because you have this, this TOMS and there are a piece of paper and then there's one access management system that's being implemented and it seems as if they have nothing to do with each other. That's a big compliance problem and many, maybe not so much uh, organizations per such, but at least in companies and businesses that we see. So passport rules must be implemented in the IAM system as well as the role concept. Generally, uh, general requirements of the GDPR, data process, uh, data minimization, all these things need to work on both sides, on the technical and the organizational side. And with all that, to kind of wrap this up, the other I promised not just uh, compliant uh, access management, but also more birds to be called uh, to be uh, killed with that stone. Um, so something that goes beyond simple compliance. And then again, compliance is already great, but there is even more. But first of all, especially if you work in a B2B context, very often you don't care that much about uh, the GDPR per such and about personal data, because what you really do is uh, deal with is technical data. You know, very often these days, IP is, uh, is digital. Company secrets are stored digitally. So 
Um, so protecting data under the GDPR is fine, but if you have a proper access management and you're compliant with the GDPR, you also protect all these other data. So IP, uh, secrets of your own company, and also very important, very important, often overlooked, uh, secrets of every company that you work with. Because how many NDAs has a company typically signed? Tens? Hundreds? Thousands? Probably a larger company. So technically, without a good access management, companies, businesses are in perpetual breach of every single NDA they have signed with. They are in breach of contract. And they may even lose uh, the legal protection under the Geschäftsgeheimnisgesetz and, of course, the equivalent laws under other uh, uh, European uh, legal systems um, because they fail to properly uh, protect their, their secrets. And a secret that's not, pro not protected is no longer a secret and doesn't enjoy the protection of the law. Very often overlooked. Uh, I get often blank stares when I say that. And of course, protection of reputation. Uh, reputation is everything in today's business world. I mean, I had this uh, this uh, this uh, example of the Cambridge Analytical scandal, but you know, so many more could have been brought up here. Does anybody still do business with Equifax, with LastPass, or any any of those? Um, no, we don't trust them. Do we trust social media? Probably not really. Uh, and then the thing, and that's, and I hope I make this transparent here. And I, I hope you see that I try to to to, to close the circle here. Um, well done, compliance is a sales tool. It is a sales tool, and of course, um, from the B two B two C side, customers want to do um, business with companies that they think protect their data uh, that have a good reputation. Obviously, I mean, I at least want to want to do that. So good compliance uh, makes sure that there is less friction, less drop off, less churn in the uh, in, in the client structure, and they may even reduce operating cost. But it's even more visible in the B2B field because business customers, they do have compliance uh, departments, they do have the green light suppliers, and they do have the supply chain acts, and they may do have certifications that have to, under which they have to make sure that not only they themselves are compliant, but they are compliant down the chain. That makes a lot of sense. So especially for small and medium businesses who very often don't take, let's be honest, let's be frank, don't take compliance that seriously. So for them, I think it needs to be explained that if you want to play with the big girls and boys, uh, you have to be compliant because otherwise you may not even be considered. You may not even be listed as a supplier. And we have many companies uh, that we look at, and that's that's what they struggle with. They struggle not so much with compliance per se, but with compliance as a sales tool because they don't even come into the enjoyment of being um, considered. And concluding thoughts, I'm, I know I'm running out of time. Last last slide here. So um, access management will remain a critical factor in the GDPR, in the compliance, but also into establishing generally efficient process, protection of resources, IP, company secrets, user satisfaction, um, especially in the B2C field. Yet it is very often treated as an afterthought, even though it is this central entry point into, um, into the space where you can achieve so much with so little, little. So, and then again, if things go wrong, especially if access management fails, this spells catastrophe for the businesses and maybe even for the management because there's all kinds of liabilities. Now, I hope I kept my time. Are there no, the questions? I, I don't know how that works. Can we ask them here or how, how does it work with questions? Should there be any? I have no First idea. First of all, thank you, Arne. We do have only one minute left, so I would suggest uh, if anyone has any questions, please uh, ask via our swap card app. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you're already registered, uh, Arne. So um, if you have any questions, you can contact us directly or Arne or via swap card. So thank you very much for your presentation, Arne, and especially thank you for covering so spontaneously for Anna. I hope she'll get better pretty soon. And yeah, so thank you for now.